Hello friends, my name is John Lindsay and I am one of the co-founders of Whitebox Geospatial Inc. And I'm also the lead developer of the Whitebox Geospatial uh, platform of software, of geospatial analysis software. And today I'd like to talk to you about a tool that we released a little while back that is part of the general toolset extension and as well the DEM and spatial uh, hydrology extension. This tool generated a fair bit of buzz online and there were loads of questions about it. And so I'd like to give you a bit of a demonstration today of how it works. The tool that we're talking about is called the breakline mapping uh, tool. And breakline mapping can be used to generate vectors of breaklines from a digital elevation model. Breaklines are simply areas where there's a, a sharp change in the direction of a hill slope, essentially. So for today's application, I've downloaded a DEM because it doesn't much matter what this particular DEM is. I decided to go with one that was a little bit more exciting than the usual one that I deal with. And uh, so this is a DEM, a LiDAR digital elevation model that I got from um, opentopography.org online. And it's of uh, an area in the McMurdo dry valleys of Antarctica. Uh, so it's pretty dramatic in reality. It's probably best visualized uh, as a hillshade. So here I've rendered it as a hillshade, and you can see, uh, you know, I've given it a bit of a, an emotive um, palette with sort of a blue-white palette. Uh, but we can see the topography pretty well. You can see that there's obviously plenty of uh, glaciers, a lot of ice around. At the top of this valley, we have an ice sheet and several smaller alpine glaciers that are spilling out um, from, from that, uh, from that ice sheet itself. The valley bottom itself, I don't know whether or not it's filled with ice or if this is just patterned ground. Again, they are called the McMurdo Dry Valleys, so it may well be that this isn't, isn't ice. Hard to tell. Uh, I'm not that familiar with the area in truth. I haven't done much to the DEM. As I said, it's a LiDAR DEM. There are still several holes, uh, no data voids, that are there that I haven't filled. If I were smart, I probably would have filled them. Um, ahead of time, but but I, I didn't bother in truth. There weren't they weren't that extensive. Uh, but I did, however, do one thing to the DM, and that is that I smoothed the DM using the feature preserving smoothing tool. And uh, for that particular tool, uh, it's useful in this application because while it smooths the DM, it preserves the edges in the DM, and those edges are associated with break lines. So it's very well suited to this. Now that's a tool that's available in the open core of white box tools and uh, you may well want to take a look at that for this type of application. But uh, again, our focus today will be on the breakline mapping tool. So here you can see I'm using QGIS, the QGIS front end for white box tools. And in fact, I've already installed that front end and, and as well the general tool set extension in which the breakline mapping tool is there. Uh, other front ends for, for uh, white box tools in which this tool would be available would include the ArcGIS front end, and of course, you can access this from Python and from R as well. But uh, I, I do enjoy uh, QGIS these days. So I'm going to run the tool. I'm going to select the DEM. I'm going to change the parameters a little bit, and we'll come back and talk about, about uh, the values that I've put in. I'm going to just increase that when we're running the tool. I'm going to give it a name, break lines. Again, it does generate a vector. So it's a shape file, and then I'll press run. If I go back to the parameters for a second while it's running, I'm just going to talk about what they do. So there are two parameters. The first one is the threshold value. The threshold value effectively determines the um, uh, value of curvature that, uh, that a grid cell needs to have, uh, um, at least, in order to be considered part of a break line. Uh, that value ranges from about 1 to about 5, depending on, depending on um, the, uh, the particular DEM that you're dealing with, and it requires a little bit of ex experimentation. A lower threshold value will result in a more extensive network, and a higher value will result in a less extensive. The minimum line length is just as it, as it sort of indicates, the smallest feature. Um, below which simply won't be output, a mapped feature won't be output. So I've set that to six, it's in grid cells. Uh, if I had set it to the default of three, there would just be a lot more smaller features. Obviously it cannot be less than two. Uh, so that's it for the parameters. It's actually fairly easy to parameterize. You can mess around a little bit with it, but generally the defaults work pretty well. 
let's take a look at the output. Uh, the default color that it's chosen is pretty horrible, so I'm just going to go back here and reset this to black. I'll change this. The vector that's created in this case has about 730,000 uh, individual features of break lines. They are, again, vectors. The DEM itself, I probably should have said, but the DEM has um, about half a billion grid cells, so it's a fairly sizable DEM. It is, I think, compressed uh, 700, uh, or sorry, 617 megabytes, so it's no small DEM. In terms of the amount of time that it took to run, I think it took about 23 seconds, if that gives you a sense of the performance. So if we zoom in, we can start to see these features in greater detail, given the number of them. We kind of have to really zoom in to see what's going on here. But I just want to give a sense of how well this has in fact worked. So this is that area of pattern ground along the valley bottom, and you can see the various vector features that are generated here that outline each of the little patterned hexagons as we have. I think it uh, generally did very well in this, in this area. Let's take a look at some of the other areas then. So over here we have sort of an area of steeper mountainous topography along the side of the valley. You get a sense of how well it's worked here. Maybe if I turn off the hillshade, you can get a sense there. So it's followed this uh, quite nicely here again. If I go up to this nice ridge line, you can get a sense of how well it's worked. I'm going to see if I can find some of those alpine glaciers that go down into the main valley bottom so we can get a sense how well it works in the sort of areas of flowing ice. Here's one. And I think you can agree with me that with relatively little fuss, it's done a pretty decent job of identifying each of these break lines quite nicely. Let's see if I go over to this area here where you can see the alpine um, topography is pretty heavily ridged and you can see how well it's mapped those out. Now again, probably I would want to, if this were for a particular application, I'd want to fuss with the parameters a little bit more and find a more optimal setting, but I think we can agree that it's done a pretty decent job overall. Each of these vectors, I should say as well, has uh, with them a um, feature ID, an FID, and as well an average curvature for the length of the line and um, the line length itself, which of course you can use in, in rendering. Um, but that's it. That's how the tool works. Um, it's pretty quick, very performant, uh, even on, on uh, sizable digital elevation models, and I think it does a pretty reasonable job. Uh, lots of applications for this type of um, tool, for sure. I could see it being applied, for example, to geo-archaeological geo uh, applications for uh, feature mapping, archaeological feature mapping, like earthen mounds. I could see it being applied in um, geological resource inventorying to identify features, eskers, drumlins, things like that. I could see it being applied in slope stability analysis in order to identify, uh, you know, historic uh, landslides. Um, you know, they're in particular defined by sort of flow features, ridges, low ridges, and this would be well applied to that. Uh, in truth, there are loads of applications, not least of which is just effective topographic visualization. I think that, um, you know, the addition of these features over top of a hillshade map creates a very effective topographic visualization. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, and that's it for me for, for now. Take care, everyone.